Hello and good morning, um, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, and welcome to the fifth installment of Spartan Step Up, a Case Western Reserve University community response to COVID-19. This web series is coordinated by the Alumni Association at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the uh, inaugural executive director of our new Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship on campus, and I'm also an associate professor of design and innovation at the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, our broadcast today will focus on my favorite topic, entrepreneurship, and I have an awesome panel of folks joining us today. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll introduce our panel and then ask them to uh, really introduce themselves. So um, Eric Hansen, who's a partner at Wilmer Cutler. Eric, would you mind introducing yourself and a little bit about your background and kind of your connection to the, to the university? Hi there. Yeah, so th thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so so I was uh, I was an undergrad at Case. I I majored in uh, computer science. Uh, had had a great time there, and and uh, and had a really formative uh, co-op while I was there at at uh, IBM Research, um, where uh, where I sort of got into patent law and, and 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 the legal world, and and sort of followed that thread through the years. Ended up at law school, and and now I'm a, a partner at uh, Wilmer Hale. Um, I, I focus my practice uh, now in uh, corporate law. I represent startup companies and, and tech companies and uh, VC transactions, mergers and acquisitions and, and, and the like. And you're based out in the Bay Area. Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm based in, in Palo Alto. Okay, when you're not at an Airbnb in Seattle. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> Uh, well, it's great to see you again, Eric. We met at an alumni event in the fall, so it's great to see yeah. you, at least on Zoom, again. Um, and Alex Derbis is here. Alex is the portfolio manager at Gilder, Gagnon, Howe, and Company. Welcome, Alex. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex. Um, Eric's contemporary at school, and we knew each other. Uh, also studied computer science. Um, I wrote software for a couple of years after Case, um, and then uh, made a transition into investing. Um, work as a portfolio manager at a firm called Gilder. It's kind of a mid-sized uh, New York investment firm focused on you know, what's changing in the world. We do public equities. So um, you know, we tend to buy things as they're going public. Um, and you know, if it works out, we ride them for a long time. Um, it's been a fascinating experience because I get to you know, spend time with um, you know, people that build amazing companies um, back before he was too cool to talk to me. Um, spent a lot of time with Elon Musk. Um, we hung out with Netflix a lot when they were much smaller. Um, and, you know, we try to, you know, that's kind of the stage that we invest in. Um, and, uh, yeah, happy to offer whatever perspective I can, um, on that. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, and finally we have Ram Fish, who's the founder and CEO of 19 Labs. Welcome, Ram. Thank you. Um, case MSNBS in comp engineering and 95. Um, my favorite uh, t-shirt from Case still says uh, turning uh, engineering, turning ideas into reality. Um, and uh, you know, on LinkedIn, when people ask me or when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a digital carpenter. <laughs> I, I, I build things that people use and has hopefully some artistic value as well. But it's about uh, trying to make, uh, using technology in a way that helps people uh, in different aspects of life. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good to, good to see you all and, and look forward to doing this on campus soon. Although um, your background of KSL, when I saw Ram's background, I asked him if he had like an overdue library book that he forgot to return when he was an undergrad. Because we, we know where you are. We'll chase you down. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that you've been on this Zoom. Um, so just a couple of just admin notes uh, for those that are watching, please keep the questions coming. Uh, my colleagues, Kate and Brad from the Alumni Council are busy compiling your questions. So I've got a Google Sheet here of your questions that are coming in and we'll feed them. If you, as I said to the panelists before, I mean, it's great having a perspective of a, an attorney, an investor and an entrepreneur um, to sort of comment. So if you want your question directed to one of the panelists, let me know. 
If not, I'll use my judgment who directed to, but it'll be a sort of a free flowing conversation. And I told the panelists, I'm excited to have them jump in with their perspectives and we'll be together for the next hour. So let's, I'll take the first question before we kind of get to audience questions. Um, I had actually shared a quote um, from Satya Nadella uh, that he gave it is at the last annual meeting about, um, he said that in the last two years, there's been two years worth of digital transformation in the last two months. So obviously we'll talk about the impact of COVID, but given all the digital transformation and maybe Ram, we'll start with you because your company is really focused on this in the healthcare space. What, what are the good things that are happening out of this rapid digital transformation that we're going through, through that might help businesses, um, whether it's your own business or as you reflect on others, what, what are some good things that are sort of coming out of the crisis? Um, a lot. Um, first of all, Satya and Microsoft are really behind where it should be. The original quote was five years in five weeks. <laughs> so uh, that's the way I heard it in healthcare. Um, there is a, a parallel quote that says, don't let a, a good crisis get wasted. Um, and at least in healthcare, the industry have moved uh, very slow compared to the potential of new technologies um, and what can be done versus what actually has been happening. Uh, that's a result of the complex nature of the industry the, the regulation around it on different levels. And what we really have seen is the five, five years in five weeks. And that quote came from the CEO of uh, American Well, uh, Roy Schoenberg. Um, on multiple levels, the willingness to move have changed, the willingness to reimburse to spend money on new ways of providing healthcare has changed. Um, you know, when I started 19 Labs, my vision was to bring the clinic to the people rather than have people go to the clinic. And at the time, people kind of rolled their eyes and said, oh, well, you know, nice vision, but who will pay for it? Well, people are suddenly realizing there is real advantages, including real health advantages to bring in the clinic to the people. So things that would not have happened before would have taken much longer or suddenly happened. And that goes beyond healthcare. The nature of a big crisis like the one we are facing today is that it also opens opportunity. It makes people and organization willing to do things differently. Uh, it forces out of the box thinking. And the people who do the best are the people who leverage that uh, wave and, and realize where things are heading. Right. Thanks, Ram. Alex, curious in your perspective. Uh, yeah, you know, we're seeing we're seeing what Ram said uh, about healthcare across all kinds of industries. Um, Education is obviously one that um, you know, I think every school right now is struggling to figure out how to deliver content online and what that means. Um, I expect that you know you'll see. Um, a lot of benefits out of that over, um, you know, Im improved education delivery, um, which we're pretty excited about. Um, one of the things that surprised me the most is that, um, you know, the, the crisis has changed the way that you can approach consumers. And, um, you know, one area that we've got a bunch of investments in is solar. And, you know, residential solar historically is sold from people knocking on doors and sitting down at kitchen tables and, you know, explaining to people, well, here's where we're going to put the panels and here's how it's going to work. And here's your electricity bill. Let's look at it together. And, you know, those people never sold online because, um, you know, if, if you call my mom or my dad, you know, there was no expectation that they'd know how to use Zoom. And now there's 100 percent expectation that everybody knows how to use this technology. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies, Solar's one example, um, they're having great success now selling online and it's completely changing the way they go to market and dramatically reducing their costs to access the market. And I think, you know, we can expect to see a lot more of that. Um, so there's just another example, a um, couple more if you want them, but there's another one. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Eric, your thoughts? 
Yeah, just just to add to that, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of a lot of early disruption and and um, you know everyone was sort of trying to figure out where things were going and 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 to Alex's point, I mean, it's not it's not just you know solar or education. Uh, there are a lot of places where there are new opportunities and and um, and you know new new challenges to to you know doing business in the in a different way than than it was previously done and so you know if you even if you're a, a you know enter, enterprise software company all of a sudden you know you can't go to conferences and you can't you, you know you can't you can't meet with with clients and customers like you could have previously and and you know the the zoom call has you know changed the way work is done tremendously in that in that regard uh, and i think we're we're going to see a lot of that where uh, we're finding finding ways to uh, you know cross distances more efficiently and and uh, and and get customers and, and and the successful folks are are the ones who are who are doing that uh, being nimble and and doing that quickly. Right. All right. Let's hop to our viewer questions. Um, the first one I'm going to go to um, and feel free. Obviously, when you guys are or putting the questions, tell tell us who you are and where you where you are, and also giving us a context if you're an entrepreneur. Or, if you were an alum, sort of what you studied, the more that we know, the better. This one, um, I don't have the name on, but um, the question is, entrepreneurship requires risk tolerance. Most new ventures fail. Leaders fail and try again. Historically, this has not been a cultural strength of Case Western Reserve University and Ohio. And how do you create leaders in this environment? Um, and, and, we, and we can think about it even a bit more broadly. But And obviously, you guys all spent time in Cleveland in any case, and sort of left in other places. So I'm curious, even from where you're sitting, and we have co everybody's on the left on the West Coast right now, but sort of curious on this question of uh, how you might answer. Maybe Ram, we'll start with you. Uh, it hasn't been a strength of case. Um, you know, uh, it's, um, but I think it changed. Um, when I graduated, one of my classmates uh, bought a one-way ticket to the West Coast to find her way in technology, and everybody thought she was completely crazy. Um, I didn't even think or know about the idea of starting businesses while being in Case Western. The way you make it change is what uh, Thinkbox and Ville have been doing. Uh, you talk about those ideas and it becomes uh, more accepted uh, as a way of thinking. Um, you, you realize that there are paths and doors to open here. At the same time, I, I think, I don't know about specifically about case, but I have a feeling sometimes, and maybe that's more in the valley rather than case, that entrepreneurship is now becoming the only way rather than one option for graduates. Uh, there's a lot of ways to contribute and learn and develop that are not starting your own business. And the risk tolerance, the emotional roller coaster that's involved in running a startup is not something that's for everybody or not something that's for every stage in life. So uh, it's an amazing roller coaster ride, but it's not for everybody. Mm. Uh, so I, I think Case is actually changing a lot of the attitudes on campus. And from what I'm hearing from research students, it is changing. Uh, and but it's uh, it's striking a balance. And my impression is that the university is striking a good balance. Here. Great. Thanks, Ram. Um, Alex. Yeah. Um I'll try to address it from a slightly different angle. Um, you know, when I was a student in Cleveland, uh, oh, I'll tell you a different way. When I moved to New York in 2009, uh, you couldn't get, you know, by my definition, a decent cup of coffee in New York City. Um, you know, there was not a single place you could get a decent West Coast cup of coffee in New York City. And Cleveland was the same way. Um, and now, you know, in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, in you know, Moab, Utah, you can't walk seven blocks without getting an absolutely fantastic cup of coffee. Um, and I think you're seeing the same diffusion of, you know, the ideas about entrepreneurship through the entire world. Um, and, you know, you, you guys are driving that. Um, 
And, and that's because, you know, just like there isn't only demand for coffee, for good coffee in the Bay Area and in Seattle and in Portland, um, the opportunities to innovate are, you know, throughout the entire world. And, um, you know, I think what we were all talking about, about Zoom, you know, underlines, you know, what is about to happen throughout the rest of the world. And there are incredible opportunities, you know, maybe not on the scale of creating the next Facebook, but of creating, you know, very good businesses that lever this you know, change in communications that comes with the internet in order to solve, you know, local and regional problems um, that are fantastic. And, um, and, you know, there's no shame in addressing those. Um, those are great opportunities. Um, they can be great businesses. Um, and, um, you know, go, go get it. Great. Eric, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so so one of the things that I'm hopeful for coming out of the pandemic is is you know to to Alex's point, folks are uh, you know able to do more from a distance um, than they ever were, and and I think I, I've always sort of pitched that you know one of the great things about being in in, in the valley is that you know you, you you turn around and you're gonna you're gonna run into someone who's you know, who's important and you're going to get these casual interactions with folks that, um, that, that, you know, sort of are part of this, this entrepreneurship culture that we have. And, and I think, I think there's a real opportunity for, um, for other regions and, and, you know, case included to, you know, bring, bring some of their, some of their alumni back. And, and, and I think, I think build a, build a culture where, um, you know, frankly, failure is, is, you know, accepted and, and, and just sort of, a uh, uh, you know, a part of, a part of, you know, growing up and learning and, and, and doing things. And, and that, that, to me, that was a real novel thing when I moved out to the Bay area was to see folks who said, Hey, I, I, I burned a bunch of cash on an idea that, that sucked <laughs> in, in hindsight. And, and now, you know, and now we're going to go a different direction. And I, and I, it, sometimes it, it, that's what it takes to be successful. And, and so I'd like to see more of that. And, and, um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that, that, you know, as, as we get out of here, people realize, you know, you talk about vaccine development or, or, you know, treatments that are being, being experimented on during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're learning that sometimes you just gotta, you, you, you gotta, you gotta try novel and interesting ways of solving a problem. And, and I hope, I hope that propagates throughout society and, and, and folks understand that, you know, that's, that's, a, it's okay to fail and, and it's okay to, to try different and unusual ways to, to, to get to an end point. Great. I have two things on adding on this specifically on case, like look at specific two stories that I think 20 years ago would not have been possible. Uh, Zyla Foxlin starting Perry Hug getting the support from the alumni, the network from the alumni, uh, getting the support from the university to, to take time off and, and pursue her dream and then taking her back later on. Uh, and I think it's an amazing thing that she has done. And then at the same time, Chris and Everkey. These things, at least 20 years ago, the kind of support mechanism in the university and the help networking with alumni. How, how did I get to know them? Because the Alumni Association introduced us because of the CES event, uh, Thinkbox. These are infrastructure things that did not exist before and exist now. And we see the entrepreneurs and the new companies emerging out of the university. That's great. Well, let me, let me do a follow-up question and then I'll, I'll jump back into the viewer questions, which are great. Because um, okay. I think you've hit on something really important Ram about how the university and our emerging entrepreneurs on campus, whether it's it's Chris and Zyla, which both came up with ideas while they were sort of current students. What are the ways that you think that the university, um, as we try to better connect with alums like yourselves or others that are on the call that can have things to share with our students and um, and help in their in their journey, whether it's actually an, in a startup that they're working on or just getting experience, what are ways that the university can do a better job in engaging with alums like yourselves in support of, of entrepreneurship broadly? And maybe Alex, we'll start with you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading an email that came in. No, uh, no, no, it's fine. Back to 
I'll come back to you, Eric. Great. So it's a good question. What does what does the university do to uh, engage with alumni? I I, I think um, you know so so I think the university's done a really good job over the last few years of of just being you know being out there or making making some targeted outreach and and um, you know getting getting folks who are in the ecosystem just just back in the mix and and i think i think um, a lot of us who have um you know who have who have left and and it, and and you know put ourselves in some place in the ecosystem i think we're happy to you know pick up the phone or or get on a zoom call and i and i think just kind of like helping facilitate some of those some of those personal um contacts i think i think is 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 a great starting point and i think um showcasing the the, the work that folks are doing in in you know projects at think box and stuff like that I, I think i think the folks who are you know sort of taking non-traditional paths to um you know developing their their skills and and, and educating themselves i think those are the folks who are really interesting you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective. And I think those are the folks who can be successful. Um, and so, so I think, I think, you know, more of, more of what's been going on over the last couple of years is, is, is great. Great. Alex, did you want to, uh, to, to share? I can really just give my personal perspective. And, and that is that I really enjoyed, you know, reconnecting with the university, um, you know, whether it's, uh, I came out and um, and and judged a, a competition at Thinkbox, which was totally amazing. Um, it, the case students and also the community people from the Cleveland community that that participated were fantastic. Um, you know, some of the things the students pulled off in a very short amount of time was was really cool. Um, and you know, been really enjoying you know all of the content that you guys have been putting together. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a great move in in a great direction. Um, and yeah. Seems like it's uh, it's moving in the right direction, and um, seems good. Yeah. And Ram, maybe even just an additional question to add on, mm -hmm. sort of the power of networking. Um, I mean, I think all three of you all embody that, but I think Ram, you mentioned kind of folks connecting with you. What, how critical are networking skills, and what's the right way for our alums or our students to kind of network with with folks like you? Um. How would I answer that? Uh, don't be afraid. Reach out to people. Uh, develop like develop the listening skills and try to learn. You know, worst case number somebody will ignore you, but the networking, the ability to reach out, call, the email somebody on a, a LinkedIn figure out and guess somebody's email and use an email tester and send them an email. You know, uh, this is an essential business skill that people sometimes underestimate. Uh, I'll give you a story. When my second startup, uh, Blue Libris, um, we were interested in selling the company and we thought that Apple might be interested. But at the time, I didn't know a single person at Apple. That was 2011. And I was talking to somebody and uh, a friend, and he said, you know, they would love what you do, the design, the skills. You really need to reach out to them. So I looked on their website and said, which one of the executives should I reach? And I said, OK, I'll reach Johnny Eve. Well, how are you going to reach Johnny Eve? I don't know him. All right, so I looked online and decided, okay, the email is going to be one of the following five or six options. I wrote him a short cold email of uh, two paragraphs, sent it on a first day early afternoon, which is the best time to send those emails. Uh, made it very easy, straight to the point, and uh, sent it. And from the six emails I sent, five bounced back. And I heard nothing back till a week later on, I get a phone call and a guy on the phone tells me, hi, Ram, 
Uh, my name is Steve Zadesky. I'm the VP of iPhone, and I heard you're working on something interesting. And that's how I ended up at Apple. Uh, so the networking skills, the ability to work with people, reach out to people you don't know, listen to them, learn for them, is one of the most essential skills uh, you need as an entrepreneur. Great. Love the story. Um, we yeah, two little things to add. Yeah, please, Alex, go ahead. Very much along the similar thing. Like, yeah. I think the, the, my wife's a, um, a historian, and you know, she likes to say, if you can communicate clearly, you win. And I think that's incredibly true. And part of that is listening, as Ram says. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I think is is an incredible skill is not to be afraid of being embarrassed and ask the stupid questions. And if you don't understand something, just be very polite and ask. Uh, people are usually very excited to explain things if you're polite and interested in the subject matter. And um, it's very frequent that I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of other, you know, sophisticated, blah, 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 investors. Nobody knows what the guy is talking about and everybody's embarrassed to ask. And I'm like, excuse me, can you explain what <laughs> this means? And, um, and then everybody's writing it down. And I'm like, well, I wasn't the only one who didn't understand. <laughs> um, and, and you got to do that. Like you, you, you know, Ram was pointing out, look, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for an introduction to somebody. And I would just take it one step further and, you know, be polite, um, communicate clearly. But, um, you know, if you don't understand something, keep poking at it. Yeah. No great advice. Eric, any uh, additional thoughts on the networking piece? Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I, the, the one thing I'd add is I, I can't tell you how many clients mine have, have um, gone, you know, hit the wall on a number of paths. And, you know, so, so be ready for rejection. Uh, you know, five out of six emails are going get, to get bounced. Um, there are going to be a lot of no's. Um, but, but I would also say, um, you know, be persistent as, as the, the others have said. And, and, and I think, um, you know, I, I have a, a lot of clients who have, you know, hit the wall in a number of occasions and, and, you know, they finally broke through with cold email to, to somebody who was well-placed in the right organization. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of value to sort of learning the skill to being just a true hustler and, 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 you know, just, just really, you know, continuing to probe, uh, as much as you can, um, to, to get to where you need to be. That's important. Awesome. No, I love it. And, and I think the motivation and the reminder to our students and our alums about the power of a cold email and hustling and following up and trying, ram your story about trying Johnny Ive on five different email addresses. It's really powerful. Um, let me just take, because it's a, it's a, a, an alumni audience, I do want to kind of take you back to your case days um, and maybe share with, with, with the group uh, either a, prof a professor or a course that you took a case that you feel like really kind of shaped who you are and, and, and help prepare you for your sort of uh, journey. And maybe Eric, I'll start with you and work backwards. Uh, uh... So I, I would actually, I would go a, a slightly different direction. I wouldn't say, you know, any one course in particular changed, changed the path for me. Uh, for me, it was the co-op. And, and, you know, I mentioned it earlier. I, I co opted with, um, with IBM, uh, IBM's TJ Watson Research Center. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, for me, it initially it was, I, I wanted to be at, you know, what was at the time sort of the the the, the epicenter of all that was happening at, at you know, in uh, technology R and D, and because it's it, that was what was interesting for me. Um, I got there and and you know people were doing all all sorts of crazy stuff, and and that's you know that's what sort of planted the seed for me on the you know on the legal side of you know IBM gets more patents than any other company in the world. You know, year after year, and um, you know, it, and it was it was interesting to me to see that uh, companies could, at least the, the thinking at the time was companies could be successful, you know, developing ideas and then licensing it out, um, you know, to others to, to to work on the execution. I, I would say, you know, good and bad things have come out of that model since, um, but that that really sort of nudged me on the path toward you know, this, this, this legal thing is really interesting. And, and, and I, you know, it's another way to be a part of the startup ecosystem, you know, sort of from a different angle than, than being a, a software engineer. 
Great. How about you, Alex? Anything from your case journey that particularly stuck with you? You know, um, the introduction to microprocessors class was surprisingly useful um, and continues to be. It's, you know, I think even more so today, but, you know, when Eric and I were in school um, an embarrassingly long time ago, um, you know, still (laughs) things had moved to this very high level of abstraction. And, um, and it's been a really good weapon for me to have in my little arsenal of just, you know, understanding the difference in latency between cache and memory and, you know, the basics of how computers work. And I don't think it's something that I necessarily would have picked up, you know, writing software um, if it hadn't been in school. And I think that that, you know, underlines something that's broader, which is that, um, you know, what I would try to get out of a university education is a broad breadth of knowledge um, so that you know which questions to ask, you know what you don't know, and you have the tools in order to figure it out. Um, and, and you know, I think that's what I got out of school. And, um, and yeah. Great. And Ram? Um, probably a professor you had never heard about uh, called Joy Levin. And the reason you have never heard about it is because he's actually in the law school teaching philosophy of law. I took that class. What I loved about this, uh, he's a Rhodes Scholar and one of the most amazing Socratic classes I've ever taken. But this is one of the foundational things that I loved about Case, which is, you know, you can finish with engineering, but you need to have a humanities minor. And I ended up with a minor in philosophy, but the balance between those two sides of the brain and seeing things from just different perspective was in a, a really, really uh, important, I, I would say, in the overall education and throughout life later on professionally affected me. Uh, but on a more serious note, on a, the actual business understanding, the most eye-opening class I've taken was a Richard a. Boyetsis class on management psychology. And some of the group exercise that we have done around decision-making in organizations, around how people communicate, uh, how to communicate, uh, has been the most important lifelong business lessons uh, for me. Uh, understanding that you can put as a large group of super smart people together, but without the right decision process, you'll get no place. And the decision process is what shapes what kind of decisions and the quality of decisions that will be made. These are some of the most important lessons that I've gotten out of his class. And later on, I expanded when I did my MBA in Yale, uh, on, on this whole topic of organization behavior and management psychology. Awesome. Well, I will tell Richard's a good friend and colleague. And by the way, he has a he has a course on Coursera, which is an online learning platform that you're all probably familiar with. So for those who are watching that want to spend a little more time in front of your computer this summer, Richard's class on Coursera, which is free, is an awesome is an awesome resource. So he's great. Um, let me go to one of the questions that came into the chat um, from a rising senior um, at the universe at Case, and she says that she's been reading biographies of any entrepreneur she can find, and it seems like the entrepreneur is more important than the idea itself. What are your thoughts? Is the idea more important than the person? Maybe Alex, we'll start with you, even kind of from an investor hat. Um, what's more important, the idea or the entrepreneur? Um, I think execution, (laughs) um, yeah, I mean, great, I, great execution is going to trump a great idea. And, um, I I don't, I don't know that I would describe it as the person, but I would describe it as, you know, the ability to execute is, is absolutely fundamental. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the person is part of that, but it's more than that. Great. Eric, your thoughts? Yeah, I, so totally agree. I, I think I think it is. I mean, not just that singular entrepreneur, but but you know the team that that a person built around themselves. But but I I think um, 
often I'll see the same idea out of, you know, three, five, 10 teams um, who are all sort of executing on the same model. And, um, and, and, and some of the people I work with just have that, that, you know, that je ne sais quoi, that ability to sort of like put blinders on and, and, and they're going to get it done no matter what barricade you put in their way. And I, and I think th those, those types of personalities, willingness to really, um, you know, laser focus and, and on, on execution and, and, you know, pick to execute in the right way. Uh, those are the fact the folks who are, who, who I've seen who, who have been successful. Great. Ram. Uh, I, I we fully agree. I'm trying to think of relative examples that will come to mind. Um, I, there is a saying that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, uh, you know, the go back to Richard's class. Uh, and the culture is the leader. Everything you do follows from the leader and how people behave in the organization goes from the leader. So the first most important thing is not the idea, it's the leader. The second thing I will touch into it is uh, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. It's not the idea that you care about, it's the problem that the entrepreneur is trying to solve that matters and what you want to invest in. Uh, or what you want to build in about. And where, to the student is when you fall in love with the problem and you feel so strongly about it, that's when it becomes worthwhile going and trying to turn it into a business. And by the way, not all problems that have a solution can be a profitable business. Uh, there are some places uh, that you know you can see the solution you can see the problem but the path from here to there is not a feasible path in the current climate uh, so absolutely it's about the person and uh, the other thing to remember is that a lot of those people who are entrepreneurs are not the nicest people in the world <laughs> uh, to be able to go and jump and build a business from scratch, one requires a certain ability to ignore reality in the valley, we, we call it the reality distortion field. And it requires ignoring other people because other people tell you that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And uh, it requires really pushing other people and it requires going into a meeting and hearing everybody saying one thing because of the social dynamics and saying, no, that's not good enough, or no, I'm going to overrule you. So uh, if you look at every entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur, you'll find lots of very interesting articles about what the hell it is to work for them and why it's so bad, mm -hmm. and what obnoxious SOBs they have been, but to some extent, that's an integral part of successful entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, for good or for bad, and how you manage it, it's a longer discussion. Just uh, remember, these are not always the nicest people uh, to hang out with. So there's a follow-up question from the chat. It must be someone who knows your background certainly better than mine, Ram. And the question is, and we'll start with you, and it's like a question from Ram. Can you learn how to take risks or is it in the genes? You took risks when you went to Alaska to earn your tuition. Do, do tell that story. <laughs> yeah, so I, I ran out of money. Uh, I, I paid for school mostly myself. And I took advantage of the fact that it was a flat tuition after 21 credits and still ran out of money. <laughs> Um, and I had uh, an amazing nursing student friend, Chelsea, uh, who was from Alaska. And when I grew up, I heard about people when I was a teenager, people working in Alaska. So I said, damn, I'll just buy a one-way ticket, work on a fishing boat. I'll figure it out over there. Um, but that touches on a point that I think is really important for entrepreneurs right now. And... Eisenhower, uh, during World War II, had a saying that said, 
something along the lines of uh, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Um, and it sounds paradoxical, but it's actually really essential. The plan, the planning, understanding where you want to go, what's the opportunities, where are the good places to be, is absolutely essential. And lots of companies have, have plans, they know where you want to go, they understand their strengths, competitors, stuff like this. But the plans themselves are nothing. And when situation changes quickly, don't feel emotionally attached to the plans. Realize that there are some new components in your equation, and now pl plug them back into the planning. Um, and this is really essential nowadays, as the world has shifted so quickly. Don't get married to the fact that, you know, I had a plan before COVID, or, you know, a month into COVID, I had a plan, and we need to follow it. Well, situation changed since a month in, into COVID. Do the planning, but be willing to adapt the plans. And, you know, the, taking it back to Alaska. Before I went, I found Chelsea. I found a few other graduates, uh, did some whatever research I could, and flew over to Alaska, met her parents so they can teach me and share as much information as I could, ended up in the town they all recommended and couldn't find a job. And then I tried to assess and said, oh, yeah, I went where everybody else went. That's not far enough. I need to go even farther. So I bought another one-way ticket into Kodiak, which is a kind of an island of Anchorage, um, because it's farther away, less people come over, and I found a job within a few hours wow. uh, on a fishing boat. Uh, so have a plan. Go through the planning, but absolutely don't get emotionally attached to the comfort you get from having a plan. Be willing to change it. Love it. Um, Alex, any reflections on this sort of risk Not a great story thing? that underlines Graham's point. Please. Um, you know, the, the current COVID epidemic is a coronavirus, um, you know, SARS COVID 2019. Uh, the previous SARS virus, um, you know, mutated and never really made it very far out of Asia or really out of China. Um, but, you know, whatever that was in 2003, I think it did completely shut China down. And at the time, there was a wily um, uh, entrepreneur um, who had a, a company um, trying to connect uh, Asian factories with Western retailers. And this virus almost completely put him out of business. Um, and instead you know, of going out of business and quietly disappearing into the distance, um, he pivoted and said, well, if all the Chinese can't go to the stores, I'm going to start a, a business to consumer company. Um, and that's the beginning of Alibaba, um, and that's Jack Ma. And um, you know, I mean, that might be you know, it's a great example of a uh, fantastic story. It might be completely made up in myth, but uh, you can read about it online. Um, and anyway, awesome, great, Eric, your thoughts. Uh, I don't know how much to add to what what they said, other than you know, I think to Ram's point, you really you. Right now, there's a there's a great opportunity if you're nimble and, and you're willing to, um, you know, hopefully you had a plan, you're willing to go change your plan, and and you know take advantage of the uh, the sort of the the disruption in the marketplace. I think I think for the right entrepreneur, they can they can be successful right now. Great. Um, another question that came in from the chat is: Does the current state of the economy and sudden need for technology and innovation? offer more opportunities for women and people of color to pursue entrepreneurial endeavors than in the past decade? Maybe Eric, let's start with you and kind of go backwards with the group. Uh, more opportunities, I, I, you know, I guess I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm sort of pessimistic that, that you know, the, the tech community has done what it, what it needs to do here. And I, and I think it needs to do a better job. And, and so, you know, will the pandemic be the, the impetus? I, I don't know, but I, but I do think there are a lot of people who, um, you know, in their own way, are trying to um, trying to find a way to, you know, contribute to a solution to the problem. And and so I think I think it's it's not really pandemic related. It's more sort of the way that the ecosystem has moved and a and a recognition that we've ended up in this place where um, where women and people of color have, uh, you know, have missed out on on some of the opportunities that 
that they rightfully should should be a part of. And and I think um, I think the the opportunity is that um, you know there are a lot of people who are focused on problem and would like to would like to would like to find a solution. And 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 I'm hopeful that um, that folks will really you know dig in and and, and do their best to, to to help solve it. Great, Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, as an investor, I. I'm, you know, I think it's very personally important to me that, you know, we fix the, the, the issues with lack of opportunity for women and people of color, but just completely ignoring that for a second, um, as a greedy investor that's tried to make a killing for my clients, when, you know, a company that's run by somebody with a non-traditional background um, shows up, I give it a lot more attention just because, um, you know, they have a different perspective on things. And you know, it's those people with a different perspective that often find the best opportunities. Um, and 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 I think that that's a, a you know, and you're seeing that right now. Um, there's tons of examples, but um, you know, it, it it's you know, it, it's not it, it's not just because it's the fair thing to do. I think from a business perspective, it's also the right thing to do to hire these people with these different backgrounds uh, because that perspective is going to add a lot of value. Great, and Ram. Um, I really hope that we are finally at a point in the U.S. that some of the fundamental imbalances and discrimination is going to be addressed. Um, as an entrepreneur, uh, don't limit yourself. Just don't, don't think, you know, is it going to change? Will I have an easier time because I'm Afro-American or I, because I'm a woman? It, it, I, I think it's, think about it, but don't let whatever existed before limit you. If you are passionate enough about a problem, go and follow your passion. Uh, it's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. And yes, probably people will be obnoxious about you or maybe racist or discriminate along the path, but that's hopefully not going to be what will block you from success. The, most, the first thing that will block you from success is if you don't try. Great. Uh, the second thing, there's so many opportunities being opened right now uh, that it's beyond what we can either imagine. Uh, this generation is going to be called, the, the kids who are graduating now will be called the COVID generation because the world is going to be fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. And you can take an approach if you just graduated now saying, you know, this sucks so badly. It look like how hard it is to find work. I, I can't see my friend. Or you can go and say, you know, that's what life handed me. This is the biggest, fastest change civilization have seen in the last hundreds, a few hundred years. How can I be in the best position for myself here? Um, I'm not putting it in the best words. If you really want to see this, Tim Cook put a fantastic um, commencement address, a very short 10 minutes address to OSU uh, two months ago and go and listen to Tim. But really, there is so many opportunities that exist now in the world. Either go pursue them yourself, go into an, a startup with good mentors um, and a principled leadership that you can go. Um, I'm intentionally saying principled leadership because when you see changes like this, you also find lots of people who try to abuse and take personal advantage. But so it's important to find if you join another company, a group and a leader that you feel you're comfortable being behind. But this is an amazing time to, to live in. Great. Um, so the last question, as we're almost out of time, and maybe just sort of quickly on this, we got a question from the chat asking for book recommendations, but I'll also add in books or podcasts or YouTube commencements, if you want to go that way, that they'd recommend for budding entrepreneurs. So maybe Alex with you, any book, podcast, or other recommendation for budding entrepreneurs? 
Um, the there's a podcast. Um, I think the guy's name is Patrick O'Shaughnessy. It's called Invest Like the Best, um, and it has it only tangentially has anything to do with investment. Um, but he's an extraordinary interviewer. I don't know how he finds time to research these people, and the people he interviews are absolutely fantastic. Um, so I've been listening to that um, a lot. So I'd, I'd recommend that. Um, and then you know. I think people who tell great stories are the books that I would read um, and about business. Um, you know, it, it also helps you figure out how to communicate, which I think is incredibly important. Um, so that's basically everything Mike Lewis has ever written. Um, and, um, you know, there's a bunch of others. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. Uh, there's a book on the, the, you know, rise and fall of RJR Nabisco called Barbarians of the Gate. Mm. That's really interesting. Tell me, Alex, uh, you're taking the books. And <laughs> oh. uh, I'll, I'll stop there and let other people add something. <laughs> That's old school. Uh, Eric? Yeah, so uh, it's a, well, I'll, 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 I can turn it back to Alex in a sec because my, my books were going to be Bar Barbarians of the Gate and Liar's Poker, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is Michael Lewis's first book, uh, both of which are, you know, a, a little bit about about you know how business got done in the 80s and 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 i would say you know barbarians at the gate it's still i mean it's an extreme example of you know how an acquisition process ran in a in a, in a crazy situation but um uh, but it, but it's 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 relevant even for today um you know in some of the deals i could do cool so um so liars poker is a it's a book about solomon brothers in the 80s and what wall street was like then and you know so i get this job at the wall street firm that i'm at now and i'm working in the san francisco office and you know, so my boss and i fly back to new york i've been there for a few months first time I ever go to the new york office and there's and i'm like you know riding back in the car from jfk with him to to the hotel i'm like so what's the office like and he's like blah 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 doesn't really say anything and i'm like okay but nobody's gonna throw any phones right because there's these <laughs> famous scenes in liars poker where somebody picks a phone up and hurls it across the, <laughs> the room and hit people in the head and he's like no 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 of course not nothing like that so i get to the office the first day and at the time you know we have this huge position in research in motion uh, blackberry um and i'm there for a couple of hours and you know mr gilder comes out of his office as somebody's phone keeps ringing blackberry keeps ringing you know and it doesn't stop and doesn't stop he picks it up rolls it across the office bounces off the window so anyway <laughs> uh, that, that was my uh my little living well, wall street moment welcome to wall street uh, and Ram, any book or podcast recommendations from you? Uh, two books. Startup. Uh, yes, there's a book called Startup. Uh, Jerry Kaplan. Hmm. You know, the first tablet that existed was not the iPhone. Uh, and especially reading it now, I, I read it two years after I graduated when I was looking at my first business idea and somebody told me, go read it. Uh, it tells you the story and it's very interesting to look backward and try to analyze why it didn't work and Jerry's story is a really nice personal story is about not just the business but the emotion the relationships and the adventure involved in building a company that ultimately failed um, so I would say that one uh, the other one that's interesting is Founders at Work um, which is a collection of stories uh, about 15 of different founders and how they started different companies or uh, in the case of Paul how they worked within a company to get an idea uh, I wouldn't necessarily consider this entrepreneurship uh, w when you start new things within a company it's very different uh, you know you don't have the financial pressure but uh, there are opportunities to stop people within large companies. So Founders at Work uh, is a very interesting quick read about different stories. Awesome. Well, this went fast. This was fun. Um, Ram and um, Alex and Eric, thank you for doing this. This is great. We really do look forward to welcoming you back on campus to KSL in person at some point soon. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, one is uh, the, our friends at the Alumni Association, what in me, we were talking about networking today. And one resource for folks that may be watching is our CWRU Connect Alumni Career Network. Um, it's actually using a platform that was co-founded by a case alum, John Knifik. 
Um, if you go to case.wiser, W-I-S-E-R dot I-O, and hopefully um, Kate maybe can put it in the chat. So this is in addition to LinkedIn, and you can use LinkedIn, your profile to upload onto there. This is an, a, a, a proprietary platform that a lot of universities are using. So it's another way to sort of build your connectivity. Um, I'll give a little plug. Um, we have an alumni uh, entrepreneurship speaker series. Actually, it's not always alums. Um, if you really want to hang out with me today at 1 o'clock Eastern today, so 10 a.m., Pacific time. Actually, when I was an MBA intern, I worked at Microsoft. <laughs> Back to my first question of the day, uh, for in a group, a guy called Robbie Bach, who um, this was pre Xbox, so he he was the head of our group and sort of launched Xbox. So Robbie will be our guest speaker today at one o'clock. And and check on our uh, website. Um, it's uh, I think it's entrepreneurship.case.edu. There's you'll see links to a bunch of different events. So there's a number of things that we're doing. And everybody should be out and about and not stuck at our screens. And we do tape these things, so um, I'd welcome you there. Um, so with that, let me wrap things up again. Ram, uh, Alex, and Eric, thanks for doing this. And thanks to the Alumni Association for hosting. And look forward to seeing you all at a future session. Have a great day.